New Phyrexia, a hellish faction of sharp metal and corrupted flesh, led by Elish Norn, Mother of Machines, has for years slowly gathered strength, information, and numbers to unleash the culminated might of their dark machinations. With the release of March of the Machines set, we learn their ultimate goal is no less than the invasion and corruption of every plane in the multiverse, until all are united as one under the perfect vision of Phyrexian completion. It's a grand and tragic tale, which I covered deeply in other videos linked in the description. With so many planes, so many races and civilizations fighting for survival in this all-consuming conflict, it can be daunting for new and even seasoned magic players to sort through the various theaters of war. So in a two-part series, we'll briefly discuss the setting and characteristics of each plane besieged by New Phyrexia, from obscure to omnipresent, in hopes of shedding light on the great worlds of the blind eternities, whose very fates hang on the edge of oblivion. This video will cast its lens over the lesser planes of the multiverse, either briefly mentioned, never before seen, or minor in grand plot lines. Let's dive in. Red Mana has fewer purchases stronger than its grip on Regatha. Suffused with the hot energies of red, Regatha is a plane of volcanic activity, of fiery mountain peaks, of erosive rivulets of burning magma. Fire is the language of Regatha and even its wild creatures embrace it fully. The plane is abundant with explosive elementals of various shapes and levels of bellicosity, which we see in cards like Inferno Elemental and Regathan Firecat. Hellions nest in bubbling calderas and erupt from the earth with violent conviction. Mount Carol takes a central role in the culture of the plane. It's revered for its austerity and power. Fire monks adept in pyromancy maintain a monastic fortress known as Carol Keep, where they meditate on the purity and liberation represented by flame. We see them in cards like Abbot of Carol Keep and Carol Keep Disciples. The religious order of Heliod seeks to impart order to this untamed plane through hyromancy and use of the purifying fire, a flame that uncovers sin within an individual's soul, can immolate in an instant, and can drain even the power to planeswalk from the guilty. The sun-blanketed plain of Pyrulia supports lush verdure on a staggering scale. A plain-wide jungle of dense rainforests cover Pyrulia in vegetation that is noteworthy for its grandeur. A single Pyrulian leaf is large enough to support humanoid species that build entire civilizations within the sheltering boughs of the Great Forest. This is seen in the card Horizon Canopy and the Plain Chase card Horizon Boughs. Pyrulia is unlike most other worlds. It's a hollowed out sphere whose interior faces the vibrant sun hanging within its center. This maintains the plane in eternal light and supports the growth of such large species of plants. Pyrulia was first mentioned as a plane visited by the old walker Dyfed in Yagmoth, who had not yet ascended to God of Phyrexia. A tranquility permeates the jungles of Pyrulia, but don't be mistaken, the beasts that roam are implacable once ire is stirred, and they stand on a scale of equal immensity to the vegetation. The reverse side of Invasion of Pyrulia showcases one such gargantuan in the Slabhorn, who is illustrated tearing into the tendrils of the Phyrexian invasion tree. The flavor text reads, To the Slabhorn, the branches of the invasion tree were as brittle as the stems of a Pyrulian fern. Two things dominate the plain of Vryn. The first is an ancient, enigmatic, and largely derelict network of massive structures known as mage rings that collect surges of mana coursing through the plane's ley lines and convert them into useful, safe sources of energy for Vryn's inhabitants. The origin of this network has long since been lost to time, but its domineering presence is illustrated in the plane chase card Trail of the Mage Rings and in Mage Ring Network. The second, is an interminable conflict waged between two factions over control of the mage rings, whose mystical power equates to military and geopolitical clout. The core states of the Amperin League maintain equivocal possession of the network, utilizing it to bolster their forces and engage the second faction, known as the Trovian Separatists in battle. The politics on Vryn are an opaque powder keg set to explode that is tentatively tempered by the arbiters that work industriously to allay recriminations between the two factions. We see members of each faction in the cards Amperin Tactician and Separatist Void Mage. The Mage Rings themselves are large enough to contain sprawling settlements and many of Vryn's population live within these structures. 
The surges of mana that flow through the network requires constant vigilance on the part of ring mages, specially trained wizards that contain and control dangerous swirls of mana, seen in Disciple of the Ring. This plane is notably the home of mind mage planeswalker Jace Bellerin and featured heavily in the Magic Origins set. The reverse side of Invasion of Rin shows a potential collaboration between the warring factions who have cast aside differences to engage in a common threat in Phyrexia. The illustration of Overloaded Mage Ring shows the destructive potential of these artifacts, and in the flavor text we hear Jace Bellerin's father, Gav, a Mage Ring engineer, say, On my signal, disable the safeguards. Let's blow these metal freaks right back to their own world. Little is known of the plane Bellanon, whose weather patterns generate powerful winds that at times flow like a gentle breeze, and at times buffet stone into sand. First seen in the Plains Chase set, one region at the edge of Malakul seems haven to peculiar looking fauna that has adapted to ride Bellanon's winds and endure its forceful barrage with strong carapaces. The wind riddle palaces, meanwhile, act as court for the Plains' regnal rulers as well as their knightly retinues. Honor and duty seem paramount to the culture of Bellanon, which we can see in its various knights, including humans in the Swordsworn Cavalier, elephant like Loxodon and the Rhino Rocks, which are on display in the reverse side of Invasion of Bellanon. The flavor text of Bellanon War Anthem grants insight into the significance of wind, music, and religious convictions, while we see an avon soar above the grounded knights and tendrils of sacred winds bolstering resolve. Just as a flute turns breath into music, we are the vessels through which the sacred winds produce glorious justice. The glistening diamond dunes of Goba Khan reflect the plane's lustrous sun into millions of fragments of blinding light. Tempestuous winds tear across the deserts, whipping up terrible diamond storms that can rend flesh and quickly erode stone or earthenware structures, rendering the plane largely inhospitable. We see one of two foreboding storm systems that constantly whirl across Goba Khan in the plane's chase card, the Western Cloud. But the plane's native peoples are adaptive and ingenious. To survive the constant harassment of the diamond storms, civilizations have developed powerful protective magic, greatly connected to white mana. Its wizards and mages are adept in conjuring large, transparent shields of vibrant light that can withstand great assault. The obstinacy engendered into Gobakan's people is illustrated on the reverse side of Invasion of Gobakan in which we see a collection of shield mages banding together to generate an impenetrable light shield. The flavor text reads, The weight of Phyrexia crashed down upon Goba Khan, but the will of its people endured. Our other glimpse into the plane, and especially its dangerous environs, is heard in the flavor text of the card Infected Defector, which showcases a shield mage that has been converted to new Phyrexia, and reads, the diamond storms of Gobek Khan hampered Phyrexia's progress until they recruited some of the local shield mages. Our first reference to Gobek Khan came with the planeswalker Teo Verada, whose origin grants insight into the deadly nature of his plane when he was at a very young age, orphaned after a diamond storm rent his village and killed all but himself. Teo's magic, and that of the shield mage orders on Gobek Khan, is highly geometric and structured illustrated in sharp lines and repetitive geometric shapes that is reminiscent of the hieromancy instilled by white mana. The plane of Segovia is a most peculiar realm where everything exists on the smallest scale imaginable. Its landscapes, its oceans, its peoples, its creatures are all miniature, diminutive forms of what they would be on other planes. First mentioned in the card Segovian Leviathan, the tiny stature can be deduced by its largest sea creature having a power and toughness of only three. Further support for the minuscule nature of the plane can be seen in the card Segovian Angel, whose base power and toughness, despite being a mighty creature of divinity, is only one, and in the flavor text we hear a mockery of a fight between two planeswalkers. When Warzel summoned Segovian Angels to fight Tommel's Garganticari Nats, the ensuing battle numbered among the multiverse's least destructive. Despite its size, Segovia is lively and replete with all manner of civilizations and beasts. The plain is largely aquatic, supporting vast oceans of bizarre benthic dwellers. 
Those who live on the continents and islands of Segovia pass their leisure time by watching the races and fights within Segovia's Hippodrome. With the invasion of New Phyrexia, Elish Norn thought it necessary only to send a small contingent to quite literally bring the plain to heel. It was invaded by few soldiers whose comparative enormity is on display in the invasion of Segovia, where one soldier's foot stands ankle high in the vast ocean and is attacked by the deadliest of Segovia's massive leviathans, who can only hopelessly wriggle around such a large foe. Creative passions, intrigues, schemes, duplicitous plots, and dangerous intimations pervade through the plain of Fiora that has at its chief metropolis the high city of Paliano. A renaissance of thought, magic, and art weave throughout Paliano's narrow alleyways where denizens meet both in the daylight and under cover of darkness to connive and contemplate all aspects of life on the plain. Politics dominate the city, where the elite high lords vie for supremacy over the watchful gaze of the monarch. Treachery is employed by all as a means to curry favor, secure clout, and extort votes on key decisions made amongst courtiers. With such pernicious deception rampant, there are many that see the high seat of Paliano as nothing more than a token of corruption, and think little on regnal decrees. Outside the high city, Fiora sports beautiful forests, rolling hills, and verdant wildlands where naturalists sojourn to flee from courtly intrigues. Along beautiful coastlines, the port city and city-state of Trest is ruled by noble elves that at times collude with, and at times conflict, with Paliano's machinations. They are masters of spycraft and diplomacy, counting among their members the esteemed Edric Spymaster of Trest and Leovold, Emissary of Trest. Paliano was for many years ruled by the ghost king Brago, a once great diplomat, leader, and politician whose ailing health led to rapid physical deterioration. Upon his death, Brago's spirit was released but bound to the throne where he remained a figurehead for the scheming religious sect of Paliano known as the Custodi. Within the events of the conspiracy sets, Brago was slain and his crown usurped by the ruthless Queen Marchesa, a scheming courtier known as the Black Rose. Marchesa's genius and political acumen were quickly employed to secure power immediately following her uprising, and the queen employs all manner of spies, assassins, and rogues to ensure the high city is maintained in an iron grip. With the march of the machine, Phyrexian forces have invaded the plain of Fiora, and it seems for at least a moment, the constant intrigues surrounding the high city have abated in the presence of an interplanar threat. City-states, so long embattled, have allied together to fight Norn's invading host. We see battle taken to Paliano's cobbled streets in the card invasion of Fiora, and on the reverse side, we see Queen Marchesa don her arms and armor to personally lead defense of the city. With so much at stake, Phyrexia finds an obstinate monarch unwilling to relinquish her title to the Mother of Machines. Carsus is a plane of sharp geometric crystals, of tribal warriors, and of crystalline elementals that embrace the surging flows of red mana coursing through the plane. First referenced in the planar card Mirrored Depths, little is known of Carsus outside of this location, which seems to act as both a source of power for the plane's wizards and mages, as well as a holy or sacred site of reverence. During the Phyrexian invasion, the mirrored depths and their crystals were staunchly defended by Karsus's indomitable warriors, which we see in the card Karsus Depth Guard, whose flavor text reads, He stood his ground in the mirrored depths, his roar of defiance echoed by a thousand crystalline reflections. But when necessary, the mirrored depths mobilizes its own legions to defend itself, which we see on the reverse side of Invasion of Karsus illustrating a crystalline refraction elemental tearing across Phyrexian ranks and reads, The crystal landslide stirred over the shattered forms of the Machine Legion Vanguard, and then it rose and rearranged itself into an avenging colossus. Sulfurous fumes belch from smoldering volcanoes and crumbling mountain ranges on the ashen-choked plain of Asgol. It's a world of fire and brimstone, of ash and death, where elemental zombies protect the lair of the Ashen Idol, depicted on Asgore's Plane Chase card. Whether the volcano itself is worshipped, or a being of immense power that dwells within, is uncertain, 
but the mount and surrounding environs are guarded with utmost vigilance to protect the sacrificial rites and religious ceremonies of Asgul's denizens. We hear of the hatred and anguish inherent to this grim world in the flavor text of Ashen Reaper, which depicts an undead elemental and reads, Eternal hatred fuels eternal fire. While the card Volcanic Spite depicts Asgul's natural defenses surrounding the lair of the Ashen Idol, as the magmatic mountains are themselves stirred to rain hellfire down on new Phyrexia's invading forces. The flavor text of the card reads, None may approach the Ashen Idol without an offering, an edict fortuitously absent from Phyrexian intelligence concerning the world of Asgul. Time and distance isolate the plane of Ergamon from much of the multiverse, and it's a world frozen in prehistory. Lush, uncultivated jungles blanket deep ridges and are nourished by rushing waterways. It's a beautifully idyllic realm untouched by civilization, where nature flourishes unbridled, which we see in the plane chase card, Truga Jungle. But Ergamon's serenity is fleeting. Beneath the sun-dappled canopies lie massive beasts, dangerous predators and poisonous prey that rampage through the underbrush. A complex, interconnected food web has evolved on Ergamon to maintain natural order the balance of which was instantly thrown when legions of new Phyrexians swarmed the distant plain. With the invasion of Ergamon, its creatures have set aside the deadly dance of predator and prey, amongst another, to hunt down and slay all Phyrexians that encroach. One of their sturdy beasts is on display in the card Truga Cliff Charger, which illustrates the creature stampeding into Phyrexian lines and states, Throughout Ergamon's wild Truga jungle, predator-prey relationships stopped, until every last invader was crushed to dust. One destination stands apart on the plain of Kylem, a location to which denizens across the realm flock to witness glory, spectacle, and inspiring combat, all within the gladiatorial fighting grounds of Valor's Reach. Valor's Reach is a beacon of ingenuity, of style, martial skill, and mystical prowess. It's a proven ground where all aspiring combatants gathered to test their mettle in 2v2 battles on display for a raucous jeering crowd that roars in celebration with each stunning show of talent. We hear this in the flavor text of Spellseeker, which states, Mages and warriors recruited from across Kylem display their skill at Valor's Reach. While the card Sea of Clouds illustrates the winding causeways of Kylem that take travelers to the lustrous center and reads, Sky bridges from across Kylem converge at the Grand Stadium of Valor's Reach. The destination is beautifully illustrated in the art of doubling season. Caring little for happenings outside of the Colosseum, Kylem's denizens were caught unaware when the Machine Legion of New Phyrexia began their invasion. But the plane has inadvertently, through the grindstone of constant combat, created some of the most resolute and battle-hardened warriors of the multiverse. They're on display in their characteristic two-person fighting style in the card Valor's Reach tag team as they engage Phyrexia. The splendor, hedonism, and excess that encapsulates the plain of Mercadia is most strongly effused within the bustling streets of Mercadia City, which sits picturesque atop a high, inverted mountain. Market stalls run through cramped pavilions where hawkers peddle wares, where anything and everything can be had for a certain price, and where dubious encounters, bribery, and assassinations unfold in narrow alleyways. Mercadia City is the centerpiece of that plane bearing its name. Here, the citizenry are selfish, impudent, and cold-hearted. While the nobility lays about and half-heartedly engage in intrigue to further their conceit and ambition, it's a city and plane of great corruption and of great opportunity. The port city of Rashada is second only to the high market of Mercadia City in exotic goods, tantalizing wares, and dangerous players. Cup purses, Thieves and spies prowl the streets of Rashada, who extort or steal vast sums of money from passers-by. We see this in cards like Rashad and Footpad and Rashad and Port, whose flavor text reads, Rashada is the gateway to free trade, but the key will cost you. Mercadia has close ties both to Phyrexia and Dominaria. Its earliest ancestors were Dominarian refugees brought to the plane first by the Planeswalker Dyfed millennia ago to escape death during the Thran Civil War. Thran nobility were brutally persecuted by Yogmoth as he gathered supreme power, 
Some were transported just beyond his grasp with the planeswalker's intervention. Another great wave of Dominarian refugees was brought centuries later during the Brothers' War by the dragon engine Ramos, who, at Urza's behest, gathered as many survivors of the Battle of Argoth as possible to escape the detonation of the Glothian Silex. The flight of Ramos and the refugees grew into myth and spawned Mercadia's great religions, whose supplicants to this day revere Ramos, which we see in cards such as Ramosian Revivalist and Ramosian Greatsword. Mercadians have long since forgotten their ancient origins and have developed cultures apart from their Dominarian counterparts. One striking example are the Mercadian goblins, known as Chiron goblins, that, unlike goblins of most other planes, have evolved into an intelligent, prudent culture, which we hear in the flavor text of the card Chiron Glider. Mercadia's Chiron goblins are the opposite of Dominarian goblins. They're smart and cowardly. We see the skill of their mages in the illustration on the reverse side of Invasion of Mercadia, where a Chiron Flamerite harnesses fiery magic to command elementals against new Phyrexia. The meandering plains and eternal bloom characteristic of Moag imbues a sense of natural tranquility across a plain that was first visited upon by Urza Planeswalker and his companion Zancha centuries ago as they fled Yagmoth and agents of old Phyrexia. The Plains Chase card, Fields of Summer, beautifully illustrates the verdure of Moak, whose landscape seems in perpetual summer bloom, and the card bearing this title might very well depict the plain. Moag is populated by all manner of flora and fauna, and it's tended by intelligent cultures who assume responsibility of maintaining harmony with nature. Dryads and tree folk walk the bowers and thickets, while elementals and beasts roam the rolling fields. With the invasion of new Phyrexia, Moag's idol is shattered, and although it is a plane of peace, its denizens are well equipped to defend their homelands from corruption. The reverse side of Invasion of Moag shows blue-wielder dryads harnessing the rampant mana ley lines of the plane to staunch attacks, and we hear reference of Phyrexia's first incursion while hunting Urza Planeswalker in the flavor text of the card Timberland Ancient. Only the trees were old enough to remember what happened when Moag ignored warnings of Phyrexia millennia ago. They were determined not to repeat the mistake. Though the extent of damage from conflict can only be hinted, it would seem Moag survived the first onslaught of old Phyrexia, granting it the benefit of past experience and hindsight to mitigate new Phyrexia's assault with conviction. Primal hunger enshrouds the primordial forests and steaming jungles of Muraganda, a plain that lies beyond history, beyond culture or civilization. It's a land of abundance where ancient dinosaurs trudge through vine-choked underbrush as rays of light filter down from the canopy. It first appeared in the ardent flavor text of Imperiosaur, in which a druid of the plain states, an ancient powerful force has overtaken the valley. I sympathize for its former inhabitants but I rejoice for the land itself. And we see the grandeur of the plain in the plane chase card, Feeding Grounds. Muraganda lies untouched by technology, by the fetters of forbearance in civilized society. It's an unchained and natural plain steeped in prehistory. This engenders an aura of simplicity free from ambition or deceit that embraces the rudimentary, a notion that is encapsulated in the restriction on the aforementioned Imperiosaur which must be cast only through the use of basic lands. And we see this again in the card Muraganda Terraglyphs, which illustrates primitive cultures and which grants a boon to creatures that otherwise have no abilities. Furthermore, the reverse side of Invasion of Muraganda shows a primordial ooze whose own ability removes those of other creatures. Its flavor text grants insight into the history of this ancient plane. Before the Tree of Life branched into predators and prey, there is only shapeless hunger. With new Phyrexia's invasion, the beasts of Muraganda fight with untempered aggression towards this implacable foe. Many succumb to the corruption and are transformed into terrifying completed dinosaurs, but many others yet hunt those Phyrexians, incapable of escaping raw hunger. The wayward plain of Chandelar is unique from others in that it doesn't remain idly in one location but rather courses erratically through the ether of the blind eternities. On no other plane is mana so densely packed, so readily available, so enriching and empowering to the point 
that ley lines and magic of the plane bear an almost sentient character. With surges of mana drowning this plane in power, Chandelar is vigorous and vibrant, and magic is used as much by the commoner as it is by the wizard. Of course those well trained can conjure the most dazzling spells on the plane, but Chandelar's native people almost all have innate means of producing magic, which has led to great advancements in technology and civilization. Five regions largely divide Chandelar, each molded by a particular color of mana. The kingdom of Thun resides within the plains as a symbol of white mana's law, order, honor, and conviction. We see it in cards such as Archangel of Thun and Warpriest of Thun. The rampant jungles of Colonia hide beneath their canopies massive hydras, grizzled beasts, and other creatures of unbridled predation. Beyond the mainland lies the Capsho Sea, under whose waves the merfolk of the plain have created a rich, aloof kingdom ruled by the powerful wizard Talrand. The fiery mountain of Valkas dominates ridges that surge across the plain and acts as haven for the devastating dragons who roost atop its peaks, which we see in the card Scourge of Valkas. Finally, the catacombs and necropolis of Zithrid are deep sources of black mana where demons, gorgons, and cultists gather greater power through death. An ancient race of highly advanced ogres known as the Onaki once ruled Chandelar, but have long since died off under opaque circumstances. Their magic and metalcraft are still sought after by the most daring of mages, and the dangerous Chain Veil is perhaps the most iconic of their creation. It's referenced in Onaki Javelinir. With the ways between worlds thrown open, the Chain Veil's foul magic seeped from a vault deep within Ravnica all the way to Chandelar's dormant masters. With New Phyrexia's invasion, the plane itself has lashed out against Norn's machines and the corrupting influence of the glistening oil. The power of abundant raw mana is on display in the card Leyline Surge, whose illustration depicts an unnatural Phyrexian consumed by natural powers of green mana, and whose text reads, Chandelar's wild magic stripped away the unnatural Phyrexian carapaces, reclaiming the true forms hidden underneath. Little is known of Tulvada, the native plane of ghost assassin and planeswalker Kaya Kassir, and what is known comes to us mainly from her perspective. Once a plane of beauty and nobility, Tulvada was torn asunder when a great aurora-like crack shattered the sky and invigorated the undead and spirits of the plane. We see this illustrated in the reverse side of Invasion of Tulvada, as shades and specters come pouring through the eerie rift in the broken sky to attack new Phyrexian invaders. We also witness the effects of the glistening oil on Tulvada's spectral host in the illustration and flavor text of Icker Shade. As oil seeped into their funeral shrouds, Tulvada's dead rose to join the invaders' ranks. It's believed that Nicol Bolas, elder dragon and planeswalker of infamy, had a large hand in shattering the sky, consequently breaking the will of Tulvada's people. The noble houses that rule lands of the living grow madder each day due to the strange phenomenon, and Kaya believes her world is beyond redemption. Setting for the homeland's expansion, the plan of Ulgrotha has been many times rent by the internecine conflicts of powerful planeswalkers. Ulgrotha was once vibrant, a plain rich in mana and creatures, of stunning beauty and variegated landscapes. An ancient feud between two groups of planeswalkers and wizards known as the Tolgath and the Ancients boiled into plane-wide violence known as the Great War. To fuel their powerful spells, the enemy factions called on ever greater reserves of Ulgrotha's mana, ripping the very fabric of its mana ley lines apart. The Apocalypse Chime, a mysterious weapon of great devastation, was used by the young wizard Ravi to end the conflict. It did much beyond that. Not only were most of Ulgrotha's creatures and lands utterly destroyed, the plane was largely drained of its mana. In the wake of the chimes ringing, Ulgrotha became a land that did not produce abundance, but rather drank it, absorbing the mystical energies and life force of all who crossed its surface. Denuded Ulgrotha hobbled on, recovering from the destruction. As new cultures developed, chief among them the vampiric bloodlines of Baron Sengir, a powerful Night Stalker who was summoned to the plane by other feuding Planeswalkers. We see Sengir's estates in the Plains Chase card The Dark Barony, and vampire families rule over their human subjects in depravity. Other lands exist on the plane, 
peopled by humans, dwarves, merfolk, and other races. But Old Grotha continued to act as location for warring planeswalkers until Faroz created a mystical barrier that separated Old Grotha from the blind eternities, isolated it, and prevented planeswalkers from sowing destruction. This is illustrated in the card Faroz's Ban. Without external threat, the plane fell to internal violence as Sanger consolidated power, spread his influence, and conquered other lands. Black mana seems to be the most prevalent on this now grim, dying backwater world of malice and death, ruled by the vampiric elite. Allusions to Olgrotha's ancient conflicts are given in the reverse side of Invasion of Olgrotha, as the card Grandmother Ravi Sengir highlights the Apocalypse Bringer and Survivor Ravi joining the vampiric host in defense of the plane. The flavor text of which reads, I do enjoy a good apocalypse. Sharp geometries, bizarre multidimensional shapes, confounding realities and abstractions given form all mark the incomprehensible plane of Xerix. Its first, and for a great time only mention, was given in the plane chase card Stairs to Infinity, which illustrates the gravity and reality-defying occurrences characteristic of the plane. Precious few sources of information exist due to the plane's natural protection against outsiders, which the new Phyrexian host learned firsthand with attempted invasion. This is given to us in the flavor text of Vertex Paladin, a geometric angel and native warrior from the plane. It reads, The literal-minded Phyrexians made the greatest mistake possible on Xerix. They tried to understand what they were seeing. Again, we hear of the plane's malleability and unpredictability in the flavor text of Xerix Strobe Knight. Phyrexia broke the laws of reality to invade the planes. On Xerix, reality merely bent around the invaders. This plane is populated at least by humans and angels who boast a strong connection to both white and blue mana. Their society has developed into one of knightly orders and graceful champions. Perhaps more of this confounding world might be learned in the aftermath of March of the Machine. So ends our tour of the Lesser Plains besieged by Elish Norn and her various factions of new Phyrexian invaders. Thanks so much for watching and listening, and stay tuned for the follow-up video in which we'll briefly discuss the larger and more significant planes of the multiverse, no less enmeshed in grand combat for survival. But now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on the planes discussed which one you want to see more of, and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of Lauren's storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, listen to the podcast, or check out the blog, where content is uploaded frequently. A huge shout out to all of my patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, early video drops, written scripts, and more, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash thelorebrands to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.